Good morning everyone. Welcome to Baijiu Exam Prep IES. Welcome to the Hindu Analysis for 4th March 2024. Before I proceed further, one very important announcement. The prelims test series is going on in which there are 30 tests. You can give the exam both in online and the offline modes. All the papers are being discussed live and there are detailed explanation also for those lectures. If the lectures are for some reason not done on a live basis, they are recorded and it is available for you to be seen later also. So this is a very, very important announcement. And if any one of you want to enroll in this, the link for the registration is given in the description box and you can go over there and subscribe to it. Now let us look at the topics that we have taken for the day. Firstly, first important uh, news coming from our neighborhood Shahbaz Sharif has become the Pakistan PM for the second time so the elder brother has not taken the I would say the throne of thorns and has given to the younger brother Shahbaz Sharif so Nawaz Sharif hasn't become the prime minister and rather his younger brother Shahbaz Sharif has become the prime minister so we'll see what exactly has happened in the Pakistan's politics with regards to these prime ministers over the years? So I'll give you some slight idea and also that even their names are Sharif. They are not that Sharif that was very clear on the very first day that they have spoken. Number two, seizure of cargo by India unjustified, says Pakistan. Now, what is this cargo? Why has it been seized by us? When was it seized and under what logic under what international conventions are we seizing this we will talk about that all third facts and statistics now this is an article or rather it's an editorial that has come which is slightly questioning the gdp numbers that has been brought forward by the government so we'll look why they are questioning that and there is a lot of data in this where I'll say very clearly here only you don't have to remember all the data we'll see some of the important ones fourth a women's urban employment guarantee act now I would say very good article in the sense that they talk about that the women specifically in the urban areas should be provided something like Manrega was there and is there and this would ensure that the productivity of the women go up and the country's progress also is guaranteed moving ahead in the prelims bites there are six topics number one advanced landing systems cut flight delays but come at a cost so what is that system slightly we'll see why the flight delays are happening and what is the cost what the airlines have to do all those things will be looked into Prime Minister to witness launch of coal loading of reactor in Tamil Nadu today. So we shall see here Kalpakam. Already last week we discussed many such articles related to space stations, uh, space uh, locations in our country where from where the space research is being done. Like Thumba we had talked in Tiruvananthapuram, Sri Harikota we had talked, Mahindra Giri was talked by us. Sorry. Mahindra Giri was talked by us. All this was talked last week so we shall further see today kalpakam third orissa's famed rupa tarakasi banglar muslim muslim earn gi tag now we shall see what exactly is geographical indications and we shall also see what exactly which all products have been given this particular gi tag now it's practically very very tough to remember all the gi you know the tags that have been given to all the products but then in a year, the products that are being given, you should keep in mind those for the prelims. Other than that, resonance, a tendency to move in step. Now, some of you who would have studied and everybody has studied physics in your 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th. And if you were worried about resonance, it has come again today. Small article and we shall see only one or two lines on this. So that if in prelims something is asked on this, we are ready to answer that. Fifth one very big article in snake gene study finds they evolve 3x faster than other reptiles so in this there is comparison of the snake with the lizards also the snakes comparison has been done with the human and we shall see some of the important points that i have taken out from this article 
Last but not the least, 100 years ago, the caliphate was abolished. Now, some of you who know this must have studied modern history, the Khilafat movement, which was done in India in order to preserve this caliphate. Before I start the discussions, can anyone answer me? Who was the leader of Turkey who had been instrumental in abolishing of this caliphate? Any one of you, please post in the comment box, though we shall see this later. Let's begin with the first one. Just a second. Yeah. You all can see the picture of two brothers, Nawaz Sharif and Shahbaz Sharif is there. Now, in international relations, this is the news that Shahbaz Sharif has been elected as the 24th Prime Minister and second time since 2022. So, for those who know, after Imran Khan, the last Prime Minister was ousted, after his ouster, it was Shahbaz Sharif who became the Prime Minister of Pakistan. Last month, 8th February, Pakistan conducted their elections and in that elections, none of the parties got a full majority, though the independents backed by Imran Khan's party, that is PTI, were the largest in number. But then, who became the Prime Minister? Prime Minister is Mr. Shahbaz Sharif because his party, Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz, has done alliance with Pakistan People's Party of Zardari and Bhuttos and some other parties and he has become the Prime Minister. So yesterday in the National Assembly, he got some 201 votes compared, sorry, compared to 92 votes got by the candidate of Imran Khan whose name is Omar Ayub Khan. Now, please understand you don't have to remember these numbers. Nobody is going to ask you these. Absolutely not needed. What is important for us is to understand yesterday, Shahbaz Sharif, after becoming the Prime Minister or winning this contest in the National Assembly, he talked about certain things. Number one, he talked about that Pakistan is facing a grave debt crisis. Now, you all can understand the uh, severity of the situation, how grave is the problem for Pakistan that yesterday Shahbaz Sharif said even the expenditure of the National Assembly is being borrowed by or is being paid by borrowing money. So even to maintain, run the National Assembly, for that they have to take loans and they are then paying for this. So clearly the financial conditions of Pakistan is not good. And trust me, nobody else is to be blamed for that. Their own policies have resulted that Pakistan has come to such a situation. Apart from that, yesterday, Prime Minister of Pakistan also said that he will not be part of any game. Now, what game is he talking about because Pakistan of late is not doing good even in cricket. So which game is he talking about? He is basically talking about the international relations. He is saying that his government would try to increase the number of friends. And under this, he also said that he will try to have better relations with all the neighbors on the basis of equality. The problem is, he says that he wants to have better relations with all the neighbors. And if you see, technically, they have got only neighbors on their western sides like Afghanistan and Iran with whom they have a very bad relation. And they have I would say bad relations with us also and on a day when you say you are trying to have better ties with India or basically neighbors he again raised the issue of Kashmir he raised this particular issue and has equated it to Palestine he's talking about freedom of 
Palestine, freedom of Kashmir. Now the problem is, unfortunately, even on the first day, the agenda of the new government is totally wrong, which clearly shows that the path that they are going to take for the next few years is going to be wrong only. And their whole dreams of reviving Pakistan's debt-trapped economy is not going to be fulfilled if they continue on this path. Apart from that, they said yesterday, the Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif said that he wants to eradicate terrorism. My only suggestion would be start from your own house. Nobody else is to be blamed for anything untowards that's happening in Pakistan in the last few years. If you have raised snakes in your backyard, they were bound to strike you someday and that has happened. So this is what had come in the newspaper yesterday. Now, just to give you an idea, uh, though last month also I had done this comparison, same year, almost on the same day, 14th and 15th of August, Pakistan and India got independence. But the trajectory of Pakistan has been very, very different. Their first Prime Minister, many of you must be knowing, Liaquat Ali Khan, was murdered in 1951. Now the problem was that both the countries, India and Pakistan, initially had governor generals. Pakistan initially appointed Mr. Jinnah as their governor general, whereas India had asked Lord Mountbatten to continue. And later, Chakravarti Rajgopalachari went on to become governor general of India. This is something that you all know. In 1950, we became a republic and this post was removed. And rather, later we caught a very good president in the form of Dr. Rajendra Prashad. He became the president for the first two ten years of our country. Comparisons, let us do with Pakistan. In Pakistan, the problem was their constitution was not prepared for a very long period of time. And governor generals continued. Now, these governor generals, they kept on doing the infightings amongst the prime ministers and in a very quick succession they had prime ministers like Khwaza Nazimuddin, Muhammad Ali Bogra, Muhammad Ali, rather Chaudhary Muhammad Ali, Hussain, Hussain Shaheed Suhravardi and I.I. Chundrigar. For those who study slightly also modern history, have studied, you must have heard the names of Suhravardi and Chundrigar. Later, there was another Prime Minister, like there is one Firoz Khan Noon, that's not that important. Then there was another person called Nuril, Nurul Amin, not that important. And then, you all know, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto was an important Prime Minister, but during his time, Pakistan had got divided. Then, Jiaul Haq's government had come, and later, Nawaz Sharif and Benazir Bhutto kept on changing this post of Prime Ministers between them. Later, Parvej Musharraf became the President, sorry, President of Pakistan. He was a military dictator. And, he also as you all know, had removed initially Nawaz Sharif and later appointed many dummy prime ministers like there was a person named Zafarullah Khan Jamali. Another one was Chaudhary Shujat Hussain. He comes from the Gujarat of Pakistan. And then he brought Shokat Ajij. Then later again, some more prime ministers came. And in the last few years, it's Imran Khan, Shahbaz Sharif, who have become the Prime Ministers. Out of all this, if you just remember the names of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, of course, Nawaz Sharif and Benazir Bhutto. And if you remember these two names, because this comes when we study slightly the modern era, their names come at a few places. And of course, Liaquat Ali Khan. Don't, no, no need to remember the others. Why I told you this? Because the Prime Ministers who get elected in Pakistan is usually not by the votes of the people, but by the military's approval. 
military plays a very very important role when it comes to Pakistan's politics right from the time of Ayub Khan later Yahya Khan later sorry Ziaul Haq and then Parvez Musharraf military has kept on interfering and they have brought themselves to control the governments directly of late that is in the last two decades military directly does not take the power in their hands but indirectly from the background they keep on selecting the people whom in their own terminology they call as ladlas favorables or those whom they favor so based on this for example in 2018 imran khan came to power and even now when shahbaz sharif has come to power basically everybody knows his uh, he would be more or less like a puppet in the hands of the military of pakistan so the fact of the matter is let conclude this topic that even though we would like to have a better relations with pakistan ultimately if india has to have any sort of dialogue with pakistan these ladlas can only be to certain extent instrumental in those talks and the real power would always be in the hands of their military and that's the reality of pakistan that's their past that's their present and unfortunately if it continues like this that's going to be their future also where the military would hold the democracy in uh, i would say in a very precarious condition that's your first article for the day let us move to the second one recently a uh, news came seizure of cargo by you know india and yesterday pakistan said that this is unjustified now you all can see the hindu reported that two advanced computer numerical control machines they were seized by custom authorities at mumbai port on january 23rd now please understand these machines india is saying that they can be basically dual use items they were going from china to karachi pakistan on the other hand is saying that see this is india's high handedness these are not dual use items but rather its specifications or the equipments specifications have been clearly indicated they are used for purely commercial use now anyone who knows the past of the pakistan when it comes to nuclear proliferation they would know how pakistan has behaved in the past pakistan's good friends when it comes to this technologies has been north korea's they have supplied you know the mr khan their scientist was instrumental in providing the high edge or the cutting edge technology to rogue countries like north korea and similarly it was passed on to many others even talks were that maybe gaddafi and all would have benefited from all this so with pakistan everybody in fact not only india the entire world should be really really very much concerned of any item which is of this nature going to them pakistan is saying this is our habit of disrupting the free trade it you know underscores the dangers inherent in arbitrary assumption of policy policing rules by states with dubious credentials now i really when i read this word in the morning pakistan calling india to be having a dubious credentials it was really a good joke for the morning time because unfortunately the track record of pakistan in this case is really really poor very very poor now let me show you this is the consignment this is got cpti this consignment has been seized and you can see i have written wasinar agreement here give me a second i'll tell you before that anyone tell me is india a member of this arrangement or not just right 
Vasinar arrangement, India, yes means a member, no means not a member. Let me see your answers after the class. But right now, please understand, as I said, China to Karachi. They forgot in between happens Mumbai. Now it is said that India got credible intelligence reports that in these consignments there were certain material that could have been used by Pakistan for their missile and nuclear ballistic programs. So for their nuclear and ballistic missile programs these new dual use consignments could have been used. Now probe has seen that this consignment was around over 22,000 kg and you can see in the previous slide only I wrote CNC you can see computer numerical control machines so I was going through some reports where it is mentioned that these CNA or CNC machines they fall under Vasinar agreement what is Vasinar agreement basically it's an international arms control or rather it's a export you know international I'll cut this and I'll write again it's a international treaty which is basically for international arms control regime and the same machine let me tell you again the same machine that is the CNC was used by North Korea in its nuclear program. Now, based on the investigation still date, they are saying there are many discrepancy, discrepancy in like shipping details, bills, which clearly show that they were trying to conceal something over here. It's not something that has happened for the first time. In the previous times or in the last times also, many times people have seen that from China, many such things have been sent to Pakistan, which they have used for their, uh, I would say, you know, nuclear programs, which is gross violation of this Vasana arrangements. Now, by now, I hope you all would have written whether India is a member or not. Yes, India is a participating member. Let me ask you, how many members are there presently in the Vasana arrangement? And if you can tell me what are some other treaties with regards to this, you know, international control about anything else like nuclear pro uh, proliferation and all. What all arrangements are there? Treaties are there. Let me tell you the headquarters, Hague, Netherlands, formed in 1996. Let us move ahead. Now in the editorial, today our editorial came facts and statistics. Now there are a lot of numbers at the very beginning I should tell you and I'm not going to ask you to remember those numbers. The crux of this article is in front of you. NSO. Now, those who do not know the full form of this, National Statistics Office. They have given a, I would say, estimate, which is a very good estimate of 8.4% year on year growth in real GDP in the last quarter, October to December quarter. Now, according to this editorial, one of the reasons why this number looks so good is because there has been upgrades in the current fiscal income estimates because of the NSO's revision for the estimates done in these years. So, what has happened is that NSO did a revised numbers for the last quarters of 21, 22 and 22, 23 and because there what they saw is that they have brought these numbers down. Now you all know base effect. Now our numbers look good because our last year's numbers have slightly come down. So one of the points that this article or editorial is making that see, take this number with a pinch of salt because last year's number is slightly less 
and then you when you compare it to that this number looks really good other than this this article also talks about that many economists they are really puzzled they are bewildered surprised that how could this be this much because most of the economists their estimates are having a difference of almost 100 basis points that is the projections that they made and the government's number is having a big big difference so economists are really puzzled over here please understand let's not talk about only one side of the argument the the scientists are puzzled or oh, sorry the economists are puzzled but at the same time there is a lot of excitement amongst the people that at a time when in the entire world there is so much of gloom uh, countries after countries are going into recession at that moment india is doing wonderfully we are doing fabulously now in this article as i said they are slightly criticizing the governments and the numbers they are saying see every place the government's number and the estimates are very very different now you cannot remember this what government has said what was the estimate but then the logic is they are saying what economists had predicted and what the government has come out with is totally different other than this they are also saying as i have already explained to you the base effect thing Their point is that base effect has, you know, last year's base numbers have come down. That's why this year's numbers are looking much, much better. So, please understand the fact that previous year's data has slightly come down. So, this year's data, because it is being compared to the last year, looks very, very good. Apart from this, in this lecture, they are also mentioning about, or in this editorial, they are also mentioning about one important stuff, that is GVA. What is GVA? Gross Value Added Growth. So, in this editorial, they are saying, if you look at the third quarter, this GVA growth, has slowed down to 6.5 percent and they are saying five out of seven sectors that contribute to this gva they all have slowed down then they are also mentioning one more data that private spending has grown only by a 3.5 percent whereas government Consumption spending has shrunk by 3.2%. So, basically, again, this, you know, if tomorrow there is any article or there is any question in our mains where we have to be slightly critical about our policies with regards to in, uh, your economy, you can use one or two points here that the numbers... You know, I have always said this is not true for this government, not true for any other government. It is true for everyone, even for the economist, even for the critics. Everybody plays with the statistics in the manner in which they want to play. They all want to show you the number that they all want to see. That's why I always reiterate data many a times reveals less. <sighs> or I would say, you know, that... Uh, data reveals less and hides more so that's the thing that you should always remember with regards to data moving ahead to the fourth topic and perhaps the one of the biggest article for the day you can see there is rosa abraham she teaches in azim premzi university bangalore and there is rajendran narayanan who also teaches here and is affiliated with one libtech india their views but then the crux of their view is they are saying that in India we should have something like Women's Urban Employment Guarantee Act. So just like Manrega, this Vega, W U E G A. Their point is women form at least 50%, or their point is women should form at least 50%, ideally 100% of the program management staff. So in this program, in the management, they are saying women should definitely be 50. 
ideally they should be as high as 100. The third point is that the women and the local communities can be potentially strengthened, uh, strengthen the constitutional mandate of decentralization. Every worksite would have essential worksite facilities, including childcare facilities. This is to ensure that more and more women can participate here. And work must be available for them within a five kilometer radius and public transportation must be free for women. So these are some important points. And apart from that, I'll show you examples are given in this, sorry, which is I have to talk to you. But before this, please understand here. Under the SDG, that is Sustainable Development Goals, one of the targets is that we should reduce the gender gap. One way of doing this is by doing more empowerment of women, that is increase the women empowerment. Apart from this, they are also saying that imagine if the women they are contributing and their numbers are increasing when it comes to employment rates. Invariably, there is no doubt about the fact that our economy would also strengthen. Now, where does this idea come from them? They are saying just like you had Manrega, Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, something similar to this can be tried which they are referring to Vega. So in their view, Manrega, what did it do? It gave a lot of fiscal or rather I should say financial autonomy to the women. Now everyone, how does the women get financial autonomy? Because more than half of the laborers who were working here, they were women. So in Manrega, more than half of the total candidates, total workers were women and invariably this help them a lot now they are saying something similar to manrega which is there in rural sector should be brought in urban sector also so here their point is the problem in urban areas specifically for the women is that there are some social norms there is lack of safety and on top of that the transportation options are not always available because of these constraints what happens is that the women workers specifically in urban areas slightly go down in this article there is a survey which is mentioning the survey is periodic labor force survey i'll write the full periodic labor force survey and they says that in the last quarter of 2023 women employment rate in urban areas were only around 23 percent only 23 percent that means almost 77 percent women they were unemployed now in this article further they say that if you look at all these unemployed women they are mostly of two varieties one who would like to work they are seeking a job they are looking for a job unfortunately they are not getting a job and the second who would like to work but they are not really trying to seek a job so they are saying this type of you know out of the 77 percent of unemployment that exists in the urban areas these are the two types of women one who are looking for the job very desperately another who want a job but they are not looking that desperately for the job so this article now says that if we have this sort of urban employment guarantee act here and they are saying that their inspiration comes many of you must have heard the name of this sociologist Jean Dres. So his ideas from there, they have taken inspiration and they are proposing this. So under this, as I said, these are, are the prop points that they are mentioning. Now, if some of you are thinking, where can we employ these women? If tomorrow we have to employ 
you know, in the urban, <coughs> I'm sorry, in the urban areas, if you have to employ. So they are saying a detailed list of all the activities can be formed, which could be given only to the women. For example, they are saying urban works like plantation. Similarly, harvesting the reeds on floating wetlands. These are the urban works that already exist and they are being given only to the women. Similarly, their point is that according to the local needs, more such works could be found out and this should be given to the women. So here they are giving one example. For example, they are saying, let's say any women college students. they should be given some sort of apprenticeship. So for example, any girl who has completed class 10th, these women, they should become eligible to run information facilitation centers in every urban local body where the computer training facilities are also given to them. Similarly, in the social audit, all the women or almost 50% women employment only should be there. So here they are, I said to you, examples are there. In Karnataka, women are handling end-to-end -end waste management in gram panchayats of selected districts, including the collection and driving of the swatch vehicles. So they are saying these initiatives have been very, very successful. And if you are going to drive these vehicles, the women have been or they have acquired the driving licenses. So their point is that if we do this and they have given in the last paragraph, they have given a number that again, according to the PLFS estimate between 59 to 59, sorry, 15 to 59 women age group in urban areas. Presently, there are 10.18 crore women who are unemployed. Even if only 50% of the women, they get interested in such number or these schemes. Now, 50% itself is a huge number. We are talking about almost 5 crore. So, the writers are saying even if 50% people are interested in that, they get 150 days of work and they earn only 500 rupees per day as daily wage. Who will give this daily wage? They are proposing that the union government should give this. Their point is that this would only cost 1.5% of GDP. Along with that, material and the administrative cost might lead it to around 2%. So they are urging the government in a phased manner, start something like this and slowly and slowly this would empower a lot of women in our country. Now from this editorial, pick up the article, uh, pick up the examples. Tomorrow if there is any question on women empowerment specifically in your mains, please give certain examples like this and this can be a very good point. Hardly two lines you will have to write in your mains, but write it that this is something that can be done in a big way for the women empowerment of our country. That's, the, some, that's something that you can do it. Now, let us move to the topics which are more for the prelims purpose here. Now, you all know, if you all would be traveling in this year, around November, December, January, you started for Delhi, you landed in Lucknow, you went to Jaipur. Now, how come this happened? This all happened because of the weather conditions. And these weather conditions disrupted the flights on a huge manner, in a big, big manner. And all this happened because of the bad weather. Now, as you all know, the entire North India was suffering from this bad weather. That is why most of the times it was Hyderabad, which was catering to the needs of the international flights that were coming to India. That might be coming from Singapore, London, Kuwait, etc. Don't think that South India was totally immune from this. In the article, it's clearly mentioned even Chennai airport, the visibility had dropped to 100 meters. 
So now this raises this big question that are our airports not equipped to fight these weather phenomena? Serious questions are being raised about the instrument landing system ILS and the installment or installation of these advanced technologies across the major airports. See, already the AI, Airport Authority of India, they have started to upgrade this. But then experts are saying that this should be done on a bigger manner or in a much more urgent manner. So first of all, please understand everyone what exactly is ILS. If you see, ILS is a standard precision landing aid established by the International Civil Aviation Organization. What does this do? It is used to provide accurate lateral as well as vertical guidance to the aircraft for landing on the runway under normal or adverse weather conditions. Now, very simple point that comes to my mind is that do we have this ILS in all our airports? So this article says, unfortunately, that's no. According to this article, only six international airport in India which are those six Delhi Amritsar Jaipur Kolkata Bengaluru and Lucknow according to this article only six international airports they have a cat 3b landing facilities Now, this is, you know, under this ILS is categorized under category 1, 2, 3. So, CAT 3, this is available only in 6 airports. So, those airports which are lacking the ILS either category 2 or category 3 systems, they suffer a lot. And you all can understand, these are the bigger airports, these are the tier 1 airports. In India, of course, South India, only Bangalore is involved here. Maybe because the weather conditions do not disrupt that much in, let's say, Hyderabad or uh, for that matter, Chennai and all. But they are saying that Tier 2 and Tier 3 cities, they are having a big, big knockout effect of the absence of this ILS. So now the big question that can come to you is, why is Government of India not establishing or not bringing this system? The reason for that is if you talk about a category 3, any airport, it would take a 100 crore investment to implement it. Apart from that, on an average 40 to 50 lakh rupees maintenance cost would be there. Now this is only for the AI to do. Even the airlines, please understand, even the airlines will have to invest in their pilots train them, give them the certificates that they have these specific technologies and because of all these reasons, this technology is not being used in such a big manner or <clears throat> it is unavailable in many, many places. Let us move to the sixth topic. You can see whatever I wrote, I have mentioned here also. This There is a need for this advanced ILS but then one point which I had forgotten, you can see here that a lot of our centers, they are now also reporting visibility challenges because of the increased pollution or smog. Now you can understand fog and all one of the, you know, weather phenomena now being added with the smog, which is totally a lot of times done by the human. This also is creating trouble. Only six centers have this category 3B landing facilities. They are very costly affair. It might cost 100 crore and this much might be the annual maintenance plus this costs the airlines also. So all that what I have written on the previous slide is available for you here also. Moving ahead, Prime Minister to witness launch of core loading of reactor in Tamil Nadu today. So you can see here core loading of India's indigenous 500 megawatt prototype fast breeder reactor. Now, what you have to remember is who has developed it. Please remember this much for prelims. This is very, very important. 
So Prime Minister will be witnessing this at Kalpakam. For those who know, it is around 70 km from Chennai. I'll just show you. You all can see here. Here is your Kalpakam. I've taken this from maps of India. And this is one image of Kalpakam. There are other also, uh, if you see, the other nuclear plants of our country. But then Kalpakam, please understand, there are some very important points about Kalpakam. Now, of course, known for its nuclear plants, but along with that, there are many research installations which are affiliated to it. Which all these institutions are there? One of them is Madras Atomic Power Station. Of course, another is Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research. Third is Department of Atomic Energy. And even BARC is associated with this. Kalpakam is unique in the sense that it is the only nuclear plant in India which has a fast breeder test reactor and a pressurized heavy water reactor. So in that sense, this is unique out of all the nuclear plants in India. The only one to have both of these two. Now, apart from this, please understand, PFBR, that is this prototype fast breeder reactor, is the second stage of three-stage nuclear power program of the country. In this, there is a closed fuel cycle. Please put one star and try to remember this also. Basically, in this what happens is that the fuel which is spent in the first stage will be reprocessed and used as the fuel in the FBR, that is fast breeder reactor. So you can understand the fuel that was used is reprocessed and being later again used. This unique feature of this sodium cooled PFBR is that it can produce more fuel than it consumes and thus helps in achieving self-reliance when it comes to fuel supply of the future fast reactor. So this is very, very important because we are minimizing nuclear waste also. Of course, we are going for clean, safe, efficient energy. And the goal of net zero emissions is being achieved by this. So please understand a lot of things are happening when it comes to your space research. A lot of things are happening when it comes to nuclear research. And all of them are related to science. Please keep them at one point from the perspective of our prelims exam. Now the next topic is GI. Now you can see yesterday a lot of GIs have been given. One of them is Kataks Rupa Tarakashi which is silver filigree has been given this GI tag. Now you all can see this is the image of this filigree. What is exactly a filigree? It's a traditionally associated with fine craftsmanship and luxurious design in jewelry. You all can see these designs can be used as far as you know the jewelries are concerned. So please understand here this word Tarakish Kashi comes from two words Tara plus Kashi. Tara or Tar. Tar means wire and Kashi means design. So you can see this sort of designing is totally done with wire. Now why it is important is because in the article it is clearly mentioned that the archaeologists suggest that this um, filigree was incorporated in jewellery almost at 3500 BC in Mesopotamia. So 3500 and at 2200 this is almost a 5700 years old craftsmanship. And they say from Mesopotamia it is even practiced today and today it is called Telkari work. Those who do not know Mesopotamia used to be the old name of Iraq. Now, according to historians, there is a possibility that this work had reached Katak from Persia via Indonesia some 500 years ago by sea trade. Why they are saying so? Because there is a similarity in the workmanship of both Katak as well as Indonesia. 
So, see, uh, personally, if you ask me, again, I'm saying it's usually tough to remember all the uh, stuff which has been given the GI tag. For example, one is this. Similarly, Majuli mask of Assam, you can see the image of this. Three types of these categories are there. Muk Bhavna covers the face. Lotokoi hanging mask, which is bigger in size, extends till the chest. And Chomuk, huge mask that covers the huge head or the entire head and body. So yesterday, this Majuli mask also has been given the GI tag. Similarly, you can see Tripura Risa textiles. This is the image here of Risa textiles, the traditional attire of Tripura people. This has been given the GI tag. Hyderabad lac bangles has been given the GI tag. Those who are from Hyderabad would know. This is the second product after Halim, which has been given the GI tag. Similarly, Assam's Majuli manuscript paintings have been given this tag. Narsapur crochet lace products have been given this. Kach Rogan craft, Banglar muslin. And then you can see here, Ambati, uh, sorry, Ambaji white marbles, Ratlam, Riyajwan, yeah, Riyavan Lesun. You can see the image of these Lesuns. These are named after a Riyavan village in Ratlam, which belongs to Madhya Pradesh. They all have been given this GI tag. Now, I would only urge you one thing. You all can see here, if I go on the first slide, this is the first article. This is the second. This is the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth. Just try to remember these 10 that these all have been given the GI tags. Beyond this, I don't think they should ask you anything about this all because it's practically almost impossible that you keep on knowing almost more than 500 stuff have been given the GI tag. It's practically impossible that we know about each and every one. Otherwise, our half of the day, half of the month would go only remembering the GI tags. Of course, you should definitely have an idea that what exactly is GI or geographical indication under science again under intellectual property rights IPR GI trademark trade secrets copyrights these all are taught so under that GI the full name is geographical indication so the moment any product is given GI it's basically a sign that that particular product has a specific geographical origin and its qualities or reputations come mainly because they originated from this area so if any product has to get a gi tag they have to show that see we originate from this area only apart from this the qualities the characteristics reputation of product all should be because of the place of origin. So, as I said, Tarakashi. Now, here slightly remember that this did not originate from India, rather originated from, <coughs> I'm sorry, originated from Mesopotamia. Just remember this much. Now, let us move to the next article. Now, very simple, small article. There is a term called resonance. Those who would have studied physics, they would know. A lot of times, this you would see that some systems have a tendency to oscillate between two points. Let's say these are the two points. The system would oscillate like this. They would keep on oscillating. Like membrane of a drum that has been beaten. If you have ever played a drum, the membrane that gets, you know, they would come back, they will go down like that, it would be happening. Now here, in this setting, the system will oscillate with a higher amplitude if its frequency matches its natural frequency. And this is called resonance. So in resonance, the system with the higher amplitude, if its frequency matches with the natural frequency, this leads to resonance. Now why I have taken this is very simple point. In this article, there was... Uh, I'll show you. Let me show you here. It's written you may have faced a detrimental, a detrimental effect of resonance. So in this article it is written that if you are sitting on a bus, the engine is idle 
and you will feel that the metal structure of the bus is rattling. That happens because of the resonance phenomena. So just remember one line about this, that this phenomena, if tomorrow if there is any question, that if the you are sitting on a bus, the engine is idling and the bus membrane is moving like this, what this phenomena is called. So you should just remember it's called your resonance. It was found around 1831. Not exactly found, but there is a, you know, in the last paragraph, they have mentioned one last, uh, uh, I would say, a uh, one example of this phenomena that the British soldiers, they were walking on a suspension bridge in England as they were all marching in the similar steps. That is all we are going left, right, left, right. What happened is they were continuously putting a periodic force on the bridge and at one point of time the frequency of theirs matched with the natural frequency and this led to the collapse of this bridge so this example is being given over here the second last article for the day a big and a very lengthy article you can see it's very lengthy article but then the whole crux of this is that the snake the genes they, the, uh, the scientists, the researchers have found that they evolved 3x times faster than the other reptiles. So, again, I'll tell you, you cannot read this much big article. Leave this. Here, the most important thing is this paragraph where they are talking about the Darwinian theory of evolution. What Darwin, Darwinian theory talks about that Organisms evolve through the process of natural selection. Everybody knows the survival of the fittest that we all have studied. However, they say the Earth's fossil records tell a more complex, in fact, a completely different story. In their view, according to these uh, you know, researchers, in addition to a constant rate of transformation, organisms also evolved at different speeds and through varying degrees of complexity. Absolutely correct. And in this article, they have compared for example snakes to lizards so if you all see here snakes they made many adaptations you all have seen they have <coughs> legless bodies they have complex systems to track their prey they have very flexible jaws to swallow even large animals so all this thing they have adopted. So in this research, almost 1018 snake and lizard species, their genetic sequences have been taken out and it has been compared. And in this article, they mention if you compare snake and lizard, the team's estimation is that snakes have been three times faster than the lizards and other uh, reptiles if you compare them to the taking of advantages of environmental niches. So after the extinction of dinosaurs, it is the snakes which evolved the most quickly. So if you see here, apart from that, you can see here, I've just now what I've said in the previous slide, all these adaptations of snakes are mentioned here. And the snakes have evolved three times much more fast, uh, f uh, fastly compared to the dinosaurs now in this article other point that they are saying is that presently there are 4000 living species of snakes number is not that important but do remember snakes can be terrestrial they can be tree climbers they can be swimmers they may have different diets they may have different strategies they because they keep on evolving Last important line in this article is researchers have already said they, you know, did this research and they have done some, uh, you know, comparisons between snake and lizard. Last very important thing is, see here, the snakes have almost more than 300 vertebras versus about 65 in lizards and 33 in humans. Human also has a back backbone, snake also has a back backbone, and even the lizards have backbone. Sorry, backbones. And it is mentioned in this article that the genetic blueprint 
is almost same when it comes to these three species, species though they have different varied body plans but then this is almost similar so do remember this point that you know all these three are vertebras last article for the day almost 100 years ago the caliphate abolished you can see the first thing that you should remember constantinople all of you let me take this okay see here modern day turkey ankara the capital 100 years ago khilafat has been abolished now in modern history you all study in india along with the non cooperation movement we had carried out a movement called khilafat movement why we had carried out this movement because we wanted to protect the caliphate and for this an all india khilafat committee was formed in india with the leaders like shaukat ali mohammad ali jauhar and some other important leaders who had joined it later mahatma gandhi had also got involved in this particular movement and had carried out this but after the chauri chaura movement being or chauri chaura incident happening in february 1922 ncm was called off and the central plank of ncm the khilafat movement also you can see almost died with the whole fact that the thing for which we were fighting the turkish people did not want they removed their own caliph or khalifa and they abolished it in 1924 my only question is who was the leader of turkey in those days who led in the abolishment of caliphate any one of you please post in the comment box apart from this two question women empowerment and gender equality are essential parts of sustainable development in the light of above statement explain the relevance of women urban employment guarantee scheme for sustainable development in india apart from this they explain the changes made after 2015 in the context of calculation of national income in india and also explain its main effects these are the two main questions tomorrow again same time same place we shall meet i hope you enjoyed the lecture do comment in the comment box with your answers do comment do like do subscribe and tomorrow we'll meet again last thing do remember important announcement i made that your test series of prelims is going on and if you want to subscribe to that you can fill the com uh, the form attached in the comment box comment box with that goodbye thank you